way when more people come in, we don't put them just what we bring them over to today. But we bring them from the top first every day. Young people, that's, that's not, that's not, no, 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 that's not. <laughs> Leaders sit in the front, never sit in the back. Always take your seat in the front. Walk like you belong. So good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Eaton. I'm president of the NAACP Mid-Manhattan Branch. And technology is one of our more important things that we're working on across the nation. And on behalf of the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce, I want to greet all of you to this tech meetup and annual technology conference. We have some really great presenters. They're going to share their knowledge of what the new global economy is going to be like, what it is like now. It's the fastest growing industry in the world. And everything is run by it now. You can't even live without a phone. If you leave your phone home, you say, oh, man, what happened? I got to go home and get my phone, right? So I want to say that on August 1st, we had a technology meetup on the Intrepid Sea and Airspace Museum where close to 300 young people took part in a conference and hackathon. It was an amazing day, and one of the fellows is right here. Tell me your name again. Hans. Hans, but he'll be acknowledged by Clayton. I want to take all of Clayton's uh, stuff here, but Hans did a terrific job. Uh, we had some winners, and they'll talk about that in their presentation, but it was really a great day on the Intrepid. We got a chance to bring our community downtown you know, get them out of the block, and get them on the boat. And it was, a, it was science week on the Intrepid. And it was the first day. And they just, it was just an amazing uh, transformation for me to see our young people so engaged in the technology and so focused. So focused. And one of the reasons why is because of a guy named Clayton Banks, who was the co-founder and president and executive producer of Silicon Harlem. The mission of Silicon Harlem is to transform Harlem and other urban markets into innovation and technology hubs. So let me just get right to it and bring up my good friend, my cigar smoking pal, Clayton Banks. Give him a round of applause. He's going to introduce our moderator for today and give us our mission and purpose of the Great Harlem Chamber of Commerce Technology Initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff Eaton. If you don't know Jeff Eaton, you definitely have not been in Harlem. <laughs> Jeff Eaton is ubiquitous. He's everywhere and does everything. And if you didn't know, he was formerly the chief of staff for our great Congressman Wrangell. So I owe a debt to Jeffrey for being so loyal to Silicon Harlem and certainly loyal to our community. Uh, so it's always great when he uh, is able to be in the same room with me. More great for him than me, but that's a different story. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I also want to thank all of you who've come. I think you probably uh, may be, perhaps, in this room is perhaps one of the greatest panels ever assembled when it comes to technology, at least for today. It's the greatest panel ever. And I'm so lucky to be a part of it, a part of what's happening today. I want to quickly thank the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce, in which I serve as a board member. But I really appreciate the way they have embraced technology as a way to drive the community, the way they've embraced technology to ensure that our young folks, as well as senior citizens, so it's an intergenerational movement, have the tools, the skills that they need in order to move themselves forward. That's our entire focus at Silicon Harlem, is how do we continue to move our community forward. So it's a great honor to be a part of that. And my, one of my partners in crime is sitting in the audience, which is Marco. You guys heard his name earlier at the luncheon, for those of you who were at the luncheon. But Marco and I put together the hackathon that Jeffrey just talked about. But we've done a few things over the years together. And it's always a great pleasure to have him. Wave your hand, Marco, so everybody knows who you are. <clears throat> I also want to acknowledge some of my colleagues that work at Silicon Harlem, which is really uh, a great pleasure for me to have them in the audience. We have back there 
who's also a Columbia grad himself, uh, Anthony Sanford, that guy right there in the pink. And what he's doing, he's actually, we're, we're, we're putting a resilient network in East Harlem right now, and Anthony is leading that effort. So very excited about that. Um, well, I also have uh, Hans and Nick with me, who are sitting up front. Both of you guys stand up. Nick is our community engineer, and Hans handles all our digital work. So very honored to have them join me here today. I'm just going to say a quick few words and get out of the way and let this unbelievable panel, really. I mean, it's, I can't say enough about these extraordinary leaders, you know, at least today. So, <clears throat> uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention Mr. Lloyd Williams, who you guys have all heard about and the great work he's done in Harlem uh, and, and his support of Silicon Harlem and of me personally. He's a good friend and a good mentor and I really appreciate all that he's doing uh, for our community. And finally, just thank uh, Columbia University for hosting us, all the organizers and volunteers. If you're looking for a, a, a snack, you can go back to that table. You can't get it yourself, you gotta let them serve you. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> uh, let me move on. Um, I wanted to quickly talk about this topic today. And just from my perspective, when we talk about economic engines and 21st century and, and, and really the word technology, I'm fascinated by what I sometimes call, you know, babble. <laughs> right, Rev? I mean the word babble, which means we're all saying the word technology, but do we really know what that means? Have we really figured out how it's applied? And that, that's an important thing to me, is, is that we don't want to miseducate ourselves or our children or our, anyone in our, in our community. I want to make sure that we have a great understanding of what technology really is. By the way, technology is not science. Some of us walk around and talk about STEM. STEM, 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 STEAM. I'm down with it, trust me, I'm down with it. I, I actually can teach in all four disciplines. But the question is, when you say STEM, what are you really saying? How, how many of you are really doing science that's in STEM? Real science, doing real engineering in that phrase STEM, which stands for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. How many of you are, who can tell me 50 times 60 right now? I mean, you know, that kind of stuff. What I'm saying is, let's really understand what technology is all about because it really is about improving the quality of our lives. That's really the essence of it in my opinion, is that we're trying to use technology to make life better. There's a reason why the, 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 this panel will talk about their great innovations, hardware, software, etc. But all of it comes from really one key source. People. People make technology work. Technology doesn't make people work. Technology assists us. The other thing about technology is that there's a diversity in technology. All technology is not necessarily the same. There's what's called communication technology. When you, you all are, half of you right now are on your phones. You're not looking directly at me, but that's okay. Because you're probably tweeting. And I love that if you can get a signal here. So, I'm sorry Columbia, I didn't mean to say that. But you, you know, you want to, you want to, you understand, you have to understand that there's a difference between uh, communication technology and what we call assistive technology, right? Assistive technology, those with disabilities, the type of new technologies that are addressing those issues in that market. There's a difference between assistive technology and educational technology or business technology or even construction technology. So when we use these terms, if we want to serve our community well, we have to really understand what, a, what they mean and how they can affect our quality of life. And it really starts with my second thing. I have five things I'm trying to get across here. I actually call it the things you should consider when using technology. One of the things that we have to always understand is technology is evolving, right? So, the, it, it, and the reason why it's evolving is because human beings are evolving. You know, how many of you have taken a camera into a photo studio to get your pictures developed? Recently. Yeah, back in the day. 
back in the day. Yeah, you're a photographer. Okay, so what I'm saying, though, is technology evolves, we evolve, we evolve, technology evolves. When I was working in the cable industry, I was proud that my, me and my team were the first team to create an all-digital network called Sega Channel. And when we created it, it was because we saw a need for young people who uh, loved video games but didn't have a way to get a plethora of them for a reasonable cost. So we decided to try to solve that problem by putting up a bunch of games and you let you have a monthly subscription just like there is today. And, um, but it was all through a cable connection. What was really interesting about that was when we developed it, having a, signal come, a digital signal come from a satellite into a what we call a head end that then serves it out to the community, we didn't have the tools to measure the signal. The technology had not been built. The technology didn't build our system. We had to build the tools to help us build our system. And I, I just want to continue to emphasize that because it's, it's, it's so important that technology is evolving, we are evolving. I always say we have a, a great company inside of our WeWork. Right, Lil, Dr. Lil? We have a great company inside of our WeWork, and one of them is called uh, Start Small, Think Big. That's the, the field that's been leveled here with technology and certainly with the Internet. You know, back in the industrial age, you know, to compete against the big guys, you had to have a lot of money, you know, because you were buying big machinery, a lot of stuff, so the young or, or small companies couldn't compete. Nowadays, you can compete with HBO. Two people can compete with HBO. Look what Facebook has done. Facebook, maybe 10,000 employees. IBM with hundreds of thousand employees, and they're bigger. So you can compete with the big guys now using technology, and that's something I think is also we have to understand is that it's about problem solving. I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to um, make that a small issue. It's one thing to just dream, but it's another thing to dream trying to uh, fill a gap. That's why we have electricity. That's why we have trains. Somebody said, why is there so many cars on the ground? Why is traffic so thick? Well, let's create a tube and put a bunch of people in and make it happen. So technology is our tools. They are our tools to do great things. And then sometimes you have to actually create new tools to make great things. I wanted to share with you just one parting thing on on this, and then I want to quickly go through what the chamber is doing about this. So I also believe that technology, both people-driven as well as what technology has been able to inspire, is almost a new way that we're communicating. There's a new way that we're speaking to each other. There's a new way that we're being heard. And as you think about that, there's opportunity in that. Sure, technology can also be used for evil, but in the use of these tools and skills that we have at our disposal now, we're actually having a whole new way of communicating. But what that means is perhaps our educational system has to be addressed as it relates to that. We just taught, I, me and my co-founder who just walked in, Bruce Lincoln. If you don't know Bruce Lincoln, there he is right there. So Bruce was around when the light bulb was invented. <laughs> but the point is, is that we, we had 21 high school kids in our summer program. We taught them all how to build uh, a complete video game. So they, they are now proficient in coding a video game. They're not playing the game. They're making the game. All right, so the, 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 and, and that was big for us because when you sit down with these 21 kids, they have cell phones too. And half the time they want to look at them and communicate with them. But I, as a, the lead instructor, I don't have no problem with that. If, I, if I'm not capturing their attention, it's my fault, not theirs. So I have to capture their attention. But I also realize that half of their learning comes from what their tools are in front of them. So we might have to rethink our educational system. I'm not suggesting everybody ought to have a phone inside the classroom, but I am suggesting that there's new ways that we talk and there's new ways that we hear. That's a digital literacy issue for everybody. I want to quickly go through, and, and let me just, uh, actually, let me say this. I want to double underline the fact that at the end of the day, no matter what your technological dream is or what you're hoping that will happen, um, if you don't consider the community or the people, I don't think you'll get very far. I th one of the things that Silicon Harlem tries to do 
is we focus right within the community, right within the people, and then we start to think about the technological advances that we need to sort of help promote versus a typical company that has technology and wants to force it into the community. We reverse that action, and we're very um, clear about that, and it's working in our um, estimation. So let me quickly go by the Chamber's 10-point technology initiative, which is focused on at least these next 10 years, clearly and squarely on digital literacy. So if, if you follow me, economic growth and social impact is definitely being impacted across the board when it comes to technology. We're looking at our small business owners, obviously, as a, as a great way to help scale our community. These, these businesses, a lot of them that have been traditionally around, still need a lot of help, whether it's online or with mobile uh, or with their platform. So uh, we're going to all have to be a part of that. We think about this in terms of uh, 10 quick things. So computational thinking, that's the essence of problem solving, computational thinking. Breaking down a problem into small pieces, solving those problems, finding those algorithms, and repeating the process. So teaching, it's actually a, a teachable uh, skill. Accessibility, you know, it's really important that um, we bring up literacy from just the ability to just understand what you're doing. It's one thing to go on a Facebook. It's another one when you have to figure out your medicine on, through a hospital. So we want to increase that accessibility. I always say data is king. When I was in Viacom, I worked for Sumner Redstone, who was the original guy who quoted content is king. I believe that too, but data is king in 21st century. The more data you have, the better decisions you make. And content without data, frankly, is clutter. That's right, tweet that. Content without data is clutter. Um, we want everyone to understand the cloud. You guys hear the cloud, 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 cloud. My computer is almost completely um, stripped down. Everything I do is in the cloud. I basically, you're, th what you're paying for when you buy a computer now is all that hard drive and processing power. Well, frankly, as we see with blockchain and other types of democratization technologies, it's not about what you have, it's about what you can share. And what I do with the cloud is allow me to be free from being tethered to my computer. I can actually be on any computer and, and operate, and I have. I think a part of their initiative is to focus on the targets, you know, and also to personalize the experience for people. We all are not the same. Is that Tim Britton I see in the audience? Oh, my God. Talk about people you go back a long way with. He and I went to uh, prehistoric school together. Security, you guys all know how big of a topic this is. Cybersecurity, security in general, protecting yourself. That's an important piece of digital literacy. So the chamber is dead set on helping to protect all of us and our companies and ourselves. Um, this is no longer just about us. Uh, this is a global economy. Uh, we've, uh, I had the great pleasure of traveling with Lloyd to Panama City, to Cuba, uh, we're going all over the world to, to make the kind of connections because we can no longer be isolated. We've got to be connected in order to maximize the technologies that are at our disposal. Wearables, you guys hear a lot about this. Well, you know, I got a friend that's developed a wearable that you put on your shirt or coat or whatever, and it detects UV rays, right? Who does that help? That helps people with lupus. Who's affected by lupus more than anyone? African American women. Wearables are essential not just fun, they can save your life. Robots, these are not just walking robots like I used to do back in the day. The robots are all types of robots. Robots are really synonymous with, in a lot of ways, our artificial intelligence. Everything's smart. You don't go up to a booth anymore to even buy an MTA card. You go to a machine that's built with AI into it and going through turnstiles or going through a toll road. AI is everywhere. And you ought to bone up on AI, artificial intelligence in general, because it's a $22 trillion business, essentially, coming soon. And finally, video and live streaming. I put that in here because, hey, I love television. I really do. And I think it's important to, for us as, as developers, as technologists, to think about next generation entertainment. What's coming? And that's where Silicon Harlem is in general, and I'm, and I'm 
happy to have the, the chamber to think about this, is how do we leapfrog technology? One of the things that I've been concerned about in communities, urban markets particularly, and in inner cities, is that we sometimes trail behind in technology. You know, when the Link NYC kiosk came out, if you guys see those on the corners of, throughout the city, we went, before they were even built, we went, Silicon Harlem went and testified to the mayor, testified to the city council, on behalf of Link NYC, companies called Intersection. Because we thought, given the lack of broadband that we have in Upper Manhattan, those things could help with some of our community. As a result of us, what, being at the table, Harlem has more Link NYCs than any other part of the city. That's for real. And first, so it wasn't trailing. We have to do that type of activity in all of these things. So we're trying to always look to leapfrog technology, whether it's through broadband, whether it's through digital literacy, whether th through hardware or software. It's really important that we as a company, and I think it's important for each of you in this room, no matter what you're doing or who you are, you ought to be thinking, what's next? Let me finish by saying our conference is October 27th. So please mark that date down, October 27th. This is our fourth year. The theme is called Community Forward. Hello? Everybody hear me? Yes. Community Forward. That means what are you doing to move the community forward? Your community, no matter what community you belong in. Or what would you like to be doing? And we're going to be sharing a lot of insights. We already have the CTO of New York City coming to be a speaker. We've got people from the FCC. We've got people all throughout the political spectrum, the private uh, sector, Microsoft, Google, everyone's on board. You are not going to want to miss this conference. It's going to be extraordinary. And it's our fourth year. Every year is extraordinary, but I have a feeling this one's going to be extra special. I'm going to finally say and introduce this panel. I want to thank you guys for listening to me. I didn't put my preacher thing on, but next time. But thank you. Let me end with that by saying thank you. And let me go ahead and transition. So we have a distinguished, maybe perhaps, the greatest panel ever assembled to discuss this topic, 21st century technology and its impact on our economy. And the only bio I have up here is mine. That's interesting. So we are, uh, we're, we're very honored to have them here, but I'm going to introduce the moderator who will then introduce the panelists. And the moderator is, is no shrinking violet. He is the man, as they say, Michael M. Clay. He's the director of the, oppor oppor are you interrupting me? No. What's the matter with you, man? No. Don't make me have to take this jacket off and all that stuff. <laughs> Michael Clay is director of the Opportunity Programs Group for the Dormitory Authority of the State of New York. How do you say that? DASNY. Yeah. Mm. You got some fans up here. You got more fans than I got. What happened to that? OK, that's nice. Yeah, I have zero. All right. I'm just going to read a couple lines here, and I'm going to bring them up. He facilitates and advocates for minority and women-owned business enterprises. Participation, so those are companies that do participate with DASNY. At DASNY, he also functions as an internal consultant on MWBE participation in construction, professional services, and financial professional services and commodity procurement. Located in the corporate headquarters in Albany, New York, Mr. Clay directs a staff of 17 professionals who focus on supplier diversity. Now, I'll just end with this. For 28 years, he specialized, I didn't even know you were that old, man. And for 28 years, he specialized in progressive, diverse management and small business development, MWBE compliance, a, uh, affirmative or affirmation action, labor relations, purchasing, and contract administration. Please put your hands together for me. Oh, I'm sorry. For Mr. Clay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Clayton, for those kind words. Um, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. I know it's three plus. Let's get the energy pumping. 
Uh, we're hopefully going to bring you some information uh, and engage you. So this isn't one of these that you sit back and listen to us for an hour and then amble back upstairs. No, this is going to be some presentations and then we're going to open it up for questions and hopefully some answers from the esteemed panel. Um, this is about technology. And as Clayton has aptly said, the, the aim here is to talk about how in the 21st century technology can help grow your bottom line. Now, let's start off. How many entrepreneurs do we have in the room? Show of hands, okay. Take note of that panel as we give our presentation. How many tech gurus do we have in the room? Techies, okay, equal number. So, what we're gonna try to do is, and I'm not gonna read bios of everybody, I'm gonna allow these big boys and big girls. They can talk about who they are, what they represent, and what they're doing. But first of all, we're, the way this is going to work, we're going to have some presentations by all three of the panelists um, from the organizations that they represent. Okay, PowerPoints, go through it. Not a long one, five to seven, eight minutes, around in there. Then we're gonna come back, and now this is where it gets interesting. We're gonna talk about technology as a 21st century engine. We're gonna talk about hardware because with the technology, what's key in happening today in technology is about the hardware, okay? And for you entrepreneurs, this is critical because you are being pressed to have the best bottom line that you can. Whatever product or service that you're offering to the state of New York, the city, the private sector, you're being told that your price has to be sharp. Well, one of the things that helps get your price and pricing sharp is your infrastructure. What does it take for you to deliver your product or service? And more importantly, can you deliver that product or service in a more effective and efficient manner, especially using social media, using technology? So our panelists are going to also talk about that particular aspect from their respective organizations and how you, because I'm always mindful of the roadmap. As an entrepreneur, you want to understand process. How do I do business with DASNY? How do I do business with the MTA? How, how do I do business with LDI? How do I do business with some of your corporate partners? Okay, because I want you to walk away from here not with a perspective of what technology is in certain areas. I want you to walk away with the entrepreneurs in the room with the how-to. How do I connect with these organizations and how do I leverage this information in order for me to move my business along? So, enough of me. First thing I'm going to do, um, we have three individuals. We have Ms. Carolyn Ortega from the MTA. We also have Scott Chalmers from uh, First Data. And last but not least, we have Michael Gershwell from LDI. So, we're gonna start off with uh, Ms. Ortega, who's gonna come up, go through her PowerPoint presentation, will then be followed uh, by Scott and Michael. Then also, when we get to the Q&A, please hold all your questions, because I'm your cruise director for this, this afternoon. Hold all your questions. If you have to write them on your hand, it's okay. Then we're gonna open up for a robust Q&A. Ground rules are, you must stand up, you must project yourself. If you are an entrepreneur, I want to know what you do, the name of your business, okay? Then I want you to ask your question and then the panel will endeavor to answer it, okay? Let's get going. And use the mic, okay. Sounds good. We'll start off with Carolyn, thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Um, my name is Carolyn Ortega, and I work at the MTA. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I've been in this business now for more than 25 years. I've got a PhD in computer science. Um, I uh, manage the applications team at the NTA, and um, we've got about 500 people in our group. We manage about 900 applications, um, and um, pretty much uh, make the, the MTA run through these applications. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing at the MTA and how you can actually do business with us. All right. 
right, so. So we'll go over a quick overview of what the MTA does, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we do in the Information Technology Services Department. And uh, then I'll talk a little bit about some related, uh, IT-related projects that we have. And then uh, we'll talk about how you can do business with not only MTA IT, but also with the MTA in general. So the MTA is made up of actually several agencies that have been consolidated under one umbrella. We've got headquarters, we've got New York City Transit, we've got Metro North, Long Island Railroad, Bridges and Tunnels, MTA Bus, and Staten Island Rail and Transit. And uh, we, we're managing rail, train, bus, and bridges and tunnels. And, and this isn't the, the full extent because we also do capital construction, but I didn't put all of the entities up here. Um, but we are North America's largest transportation network. Uh, we serve 15.3 million people spanning New York City, Long Island, New York State, and Connecticut. We have a daily ridership of more than 8 million people a day. And we employ close to 70,000 people. Uh, we have an operating budget of 15.1 billion. So there is lots of money for us to do business with, with entrepreneurs and with people in the community. So what are the services that the Information Technology Department provides? So in my group, we manage applications, we do development, um, we support applications, uh, we um, manage databases and middleware. And to, um, to Michael's point, one of the major initiatives in my group, um, many of our applications were developed 20, 30, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and even that's old now, 10 years ago. And we're going through a major transformation of taking many of these legacy applications and moving them into the cloud. So in some cases, they're being retired and we're developing new. In, in other cases, we're taking them, we're containerizing them, we're putting them onto the uh, cloud platform because there's a tremendous amount of savings in being able to move these applications into the cloud. We're kind of eliminating a lot of the infrastructure and, and taking advantage of a lot of the efficiencies that you get out of uh, cloud technology. Uh, we also manage infrastructure, uh, servers, storage, networks, operating systems. Uh, so the other... Uh, 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 bullets that you see are, are really other teams. I manage the application development team. Uh, we provide desktop support. Um, so that is all of the applications that kind of run on your desktops. Uh, we also uh, provide operations uh, support, which is our customer management center. Uh, we do monitoring, backups, and uh, security. A another really important uh, uh, topic in technology now. Um, we have a security team that does monitoring against cyber attacks. Um, they secure our information and data, and they also secure uh, all of the operations and transactions that we perform. And then we have a, a governance, and that governance handles kind of project administration, along with um, uh, determining kind of what the priorities are with the business in terms of the work that we do. So from from the MTA IT perspective, if you have any sort of background in any of these areas and you'd like to do business, we always have projects where we're augmenting our staff with um, consulting or we're actually going out and we're partnering, partnering with other businesses to come in and to work with us because we recognize that uh, technologies, um, we don't always have the expertise internally and we partner with, with businesses to come in to work with us to bring that technology in. So just a sample of some of the projects that we're working on. Uh, the Enterprise Asset Management Project. This is a $400 million project. And this project really is about um, taking all of our operational assets. So that is from trains, buses, bridges and tunnels. And we are bringing those assets into uh, a massive system that will handle work order management, um, also um, sustainability uh, for that equipment. Uh, we do predictive analysis from that equipment so that we can determine when it's time to do support on trains, on buses, on, on all of these various parts and um, determine before it breaks 
you know, how we can fix this equipment. And so the thought is that if you're able to keep this equipment up and running and you're able to maintain it and you can predict prior to its failure when it's going to fail, you can uh, uh, get purchases in quickly, um, you can uh, improve safety by making sure that you're doing your maintenance on time. Um, you can uh, save money by doing bulk orders of, of uh, equipment uh, when you need it for uh, maintenance. Uh, another major initiative is a new fair payment system. And so that will be a state-of-the-art state payment system that will incorporate accounts across the MTA. So you will be able to use one account to go from rail to train to bus uh, to even uh, bridges and tunnels. And so, you know, it's working with EasyPass and all of these other companies to try to um, uh, merge into an account system where you create an account and then you can travel from, you know, from Connecticut all the way down to Brooklyn with one account with one fare. Uh, beacon technology. Uh, so that is a new technology that we're rolling out on the trains themselves. And what that does is this technology helps provide improved real-time data about train movement. So train arrivals into stations, train departures, locations of trains, things like this. This is, uh, we, we're already rolling this out on a couple of the lines, the N line, the R line, and this will really improve the data that uh, you see when you go into the trains and you see the countdown clocks and it tells you a train's gonna arrive in two minutes or you know there's a train uh, five minutes away. Um, and then we're working with lots of emerging technologies. Um, so right now I can tell you there are a couple of POCs that, that we're working on. Uh, one is with virtual reality and we're trying to uh, uh, bring virtual reality into uh, training and how we can train um, our maintenance workers who provide service on buses and trains using um, some of these uh, new uh, uh, technology components like HoloLens, um, uh, the Samsung gear, and so on. And uh, we're working with some, some groups that uh, have uh, user groups, virtual reality user groups that are partnering uh, with us to do these POCs. Uh, in addition, we're working with ultra-wideband, and, and that one it might be a little top secret, but <laughs> we're coming out with a pilot to um, allow you to walk through the turnstiles with a key fob so that you won't be using the Metro card. So we're piloting that. We're going to be doing that at one of uh, our stations, uh, just one station first, and this will also coincide with a whole new fairment new fair payment system. So that would be, it would augment it. Um, and then we have just standard kind of technologies, right? Like um, uh, PeopleSoft, we have a massive PeopleSoft system. We're always looking for people there. It seems like we're always doing upgrades. Um, Oracle has now come out with this new method for doing upgrades to these systems and they're called PUM updates. And so it's like rolling updates. So every three months we're updating these systems. So if you'd like to do business with MTAIT, you know, there, there are three simple ways to do this, right? One, we publish open source data for developers and entrepreneurs. So the, the open source um, data that we provide is around uh, the, the train schedules and around the arrival times and departure times for those trains. And as I said, we're, we're improving that data uh, even more every day. Uh, we're also working on publishing more. I just came from a meeting this morning where uh, we're talking about publishing construction information and a whole bunch of data that could supplement this data that we're publishing for, uh, for developers and, um, and for people who do business in analytics. Uh, another opportunity would be providing your services through contracting, right? And I, I have another page that will, will show exactly how you do that. Um, and then you could also apply for employment at the MTA. So we actually have a website on mta.info called Doing Business with the MTA. And so these are the various ways that you can um, work with the MTA to, uh, ed to further your, your business. One, you can advertise on MetroCard. So if, you know, with the ridership that we have, 8 million people a day, if you want to put your logos on MetroCard for marketing and so on, you can do that. 
Um, we also have contracting opportunities for disadvantaged uh, minority and uh, women-owned businesses. And uh, if you go to any of these links here, you will be able to see the instructions on how you can work with the MTA. Um, as I mentioned, we have developer resources, we have employment, um, we also have, which was news to me, the Small Business Development Program. So I think that would, would be definitely a site for many people here to take a look at. And the other uh, great thing about this is, you know, the MTA is a state agency. And while we're a state agency, there are many state agencies and, and city and local government that have very similar programs. So I would encourage you to go and check, you know, some of the other websites to, you know, sort of uh, look for the contracting opportunities for disadvantage. Um, minority and women-owned businesses. So with that, um, you can visit mta.info and get more information, and then, you know, if you have more questions about what we're actually doing at the MTA technology-wise, I'd be happy to answer them uh, with the panel. So thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, we're going to keep this going and ask uh, Scott to come up from First Data to talk about uh, his organization a little bit, and then following up will be Michael Gershwell from ALDI. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's an honor to be part of the greatest technical panel right. ever. <laughs> I want to make sure my boss hears that. So what I wanted to do today was just take a few minutes to talk about a little more in general what technology is and where technology is in the industry. Um, I am with First Data. If you're not familiar with First Data, First Data is a, oh, I'll just simplify and break it down into two areas. We do payment processing. Um, if you've used a credit card, on that behalf of First Data, thank you, because that's where we sit. Um, if you're wondering what goes on behind the scenes, I will say that um, okay. Um, when you talk about big systems um, for the number of transactions of first data, we don't talk millions. We talk billions of transactions. We're not talking billions of dollars. We're talking trillions of dollars go through our systems. So these are big systems. The other area which is very applicable for today is first data is uh, definitely a promoter of innovation and um, in supporting your entire business. So whether it's uh, giving you the capabilities to build systems using our technologies, or it's um, in, in partnering with us and grabbing software and using software that can uh, run your entire business. Uh, First Aid is a big player there. Um, for myself, I've been now 10 years plus in the fintech industry, many, many more years than that overall. Um, too many to, to even mention. Um, I've been in all areas of software, building, designing. My teams have done the same. Uh, the focus is always on how do we use technology to meet the current and future needs of business how to sustain growth, and how do we promote growth through technology. Um, when I meet with people, I always make sure we say up front, what is the goal of technology? It's to help you do what you do best and do it better. It's to do it in an integrated approach, and it's to use uh, technology in all areas of your business. Um, I'll get into a little more of that, but the, the bottom line is what is technology? It's an enabler. Technology should be enabling your business. Um, technology is better today than it's ever been at enabling business. Um, you'll see some examples and, and we talk about, I'll talk about why this is happening, but technology, that, that layer of, um, that, that kind of scares people, that, it's the intimidation layer that's there for technology, we, we've stripped that away a lot. Um, right now you should be able to enable all functions, all areas of your business in an integrated approach um, so that it's not you changing your business to technology. It's these solutions are now configurable so that you can change them and you can use them to the way you want to do business. I mentioned a lot of different areas here. I'm not going to go through them all. Um, I'll talk about security a little later. Um, I just want to mention analytics and strategy. Um, when I mentioned the goal of business is not just to support what you do today, it's also what you do in the future. Um, companies, small business, entrepreneurs, when you set your, stra uh, your strategies and you try to facilitate the strategic planning that you're doing. You need data, you need analytical tools to do that. Um, right now, tech, technology is really enabling that. The ability to get the vast amounts of data and to use really advanced technological uh, analytical tools. Um, it's an area of the business that technology has been very um, successful at. So 
you know, just to reiterate, it's not just your current um, functions in your business, it's trying to promote and, and enable what you do in the future. And how are we doing this? Why is technology, why is it that hockey stick where right now we're enabling business better and better every day? The key word is integration. Um, you know, the, the definition of integration is seamless combination of technology, seamless being the key. We were able to put together components into service and application suites now better than ever that will facilitate all these different areas of business. Um, integration is, you know, when I go way back into my career and we look at how we're going to get things to start working together, that was the, 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 on the horizon, that was the goal. And right now, um, I, what I call the two layers of innovation. Right now, I, I don't want to pat ourselves on the back in the technological industry, but we've kind of got it. Integration now is a very achievable goal, and we're seeing that with things like cloud technologies, and if you're familiar with Amazon Web Services or Web Services, um, things like artificial intelligence, the ability to um, take technologies and put them together and to come up with bigger pieces that are going to provide real value. So I talk about the two layers. is that bottom layer. This is the kind of the behind the curtain, the technology of integration itself. These are the standards and the best practice and the technologies that we use to build technologies on top of that we can put them together. Um, the real power in that is, and we'll talk about hardware and software, is no matter what the function, the channel, the location, or no matter what the device, you know, you can run business at any level on your phone, your iPad, your workstation, your laptop. You can have business running internationally. You can sell internationally from a small facility. Um, you could take advantage of that bottom layer, and that's what our top layer engineers are doing. Um, and they're doing so faster and more, and, and they're coming up with solutions that are more powerful all the time. The software engineers, they rely on that low-level integration and they deliver solutions faster. They do it on any device. And for companies like First Data, when we're looking at how we can provide real value to, to merchants or to our innovative partners, it's that level of integration that we're providing. And we'll talk more about that later, but that's for me, because I've always been in that, that kind of level, it's real exciting to see how all of that's coming together right now, how integration is the key and we're really delivering on that. Sure, sure. Um, so, so what's the benefit? Integration is a great word, but what does it mean to um, people who are trying to either innovate in the area of technology, run their business? Um, it really means that no longer are you, if you have a small business and you're looking for solutions in a number of different areas that you have to maybe go and f talk to five or six different people. You should really be demanding now application suites. These are self-contained solutions that will provide value in all areas of your business. Um, these are also technologies are, and solutions that are using best in breed technologies. Small business now has access to the same technologies that the leaders in the industry are using. They have access to uh, the best and the, the fastest and the most, um, from an investment standpoint, the most optimal solutions. Um, that you also look that there's vertical solutions. There are, you know, like I said, there's no need anymore to have to transform your business into the software. It's the other way around. Everything is so configurable now, and you can find vertical solutions that are in your area of business. Um, I mentioned security. Um, security always comes at the top of the list when you talk to people. What's your number one concern? Security is always up there. It's securing my own data, my customers' data. It's keeping the bad guys out. Um, this is a great example where integration is really delivering. Um, you know, we've all heard about artificial intelligence and machine learning and neural networking and um, being able to take vast amounts of data and find patterns in it. Um, that adaptive multi-layer security, those solutions are available to small and medium-sized businesses now and entrepreneurs because they're out there, they're able to integrate these solutions and take advantage of what companies um, at the forefront of the technology you're doing. Um, security is just an example, but you can be looking for that in all those different types of solutions to run your business on. And, you know, what's the biggest benefit? It just goes without saying that technology right now, better than ever, um, is driving innovation and growth for innovators out there who want to be developing, for people who are looking how to engage with technology for their small business. Um, you really need to be demanding these all inclusive solutions to drive your entire business. So, so last slide, how do we do that? Um, or, or what should you be doing? You know, the first sentence there kind of recaps what I said, but it's, it's, it's more so now more important 
to develop really strong relationships with the software providers that you have. Um, I mean, it's, it, it goes without saying you want to have a good relationship, but the more they know about your business, the more they can tailor that software to you, and the more they can provide real uh, uh, value to you. So when you talk about, like at First Data, we have our Clover solution, which is a all-encompassing point of sale, hardware, software. It's a, it's a suite of applications. Um, you know, you develop really good relationships with the people. Let our people know what you're looking for, then they can tailor that to you. Um, it kind of looks like, to me, I always think of it on your iPhone, all those apps that you download. That's what Clover is, the ability to download and to use applications just to run your entire business from inventory management to ordering to selling, analytics to support your strategic and the tactical responses to your strategies. Um, the more we know about what you're trying to do in your business, the better we are at providing those services. Um, and just the tagline at the end, which I always tell people is, you know, you should be out there, take advantage of all the integration, take advantage of all that work that goes on at the bottom layer. Take advantage of the people like our, our solutionists that are at the top layer building these some for you. Well, that's all I had. I couldn't say it better than that. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you Scott. Um, I was just told that we are streaming live. Um, and you just heard it, <laughs> so we are streaming live. We've now, up, we now have Mike coming up, who's going to be talking, um, representing LDI, going through his presentation, and then now, after the CAM presentations, we'll get into specific conversations about technology and a little bit of hardware, and then Q&A. Uh, while I set up, um, anyone in this room that's ever printed anything, please stand up. Stand up, stand up. I can't see hands. Stand up. If you've ever sent an email, sit back down. I just figured that's going to take less time than giving everybody a cup of coffee. It's been a long day for all of you, yes? So, uh, yeah, I'm Michael Gershfeld. I am the director of sales for a technology company here in uh, Midtown Manhattan called LDI. And uh, we are basically technology integrators. So uh, we believe that every one of you in this room could do better. Uh, every one of our clients can do better, and everything that we do revolves around having you do better. So uh, the bottom line is, let me get this up. Um, I thought today would be interesting um, if I actually took you through, what's going on here, guys? Security alert. Security alert. All right, so we could do it without the PowerPoint. So the bottom line is, um, we believe that everyone in this room can do better and that technology can help you do better. So everyone that spoke before me, I, I could have paid them all 20 bucks to uh, tee it up for me. They did a great job. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about trends, uh, what's happening out in the industry today, and uh, kind of revolve it around a print environment because that's one of the things that we do. So if I could have my PowerPoint, that would be better for everyone else. Beautiful. Technology, gotta love it. <laughs> so uh, to start with, um, I've got a couple of uh, bullet points that are from uh, some of the industry experts, independent consultants. So a few things you might not know. Companies are spending one to 3% of annual revenue on printing. That's a lot of money. If you incorporate the cost of document management and uh, creating and storing and securing documents, it actually goes as high as 5%. That is a very, very big number. When we go in and we talk to people, 90% of the people we talk to have no idea what their costs are associated with print. And what is most interesting is, um, if we approach the MTA, they know what their lease payment is for their copiers. They might know what their annual spend is for toner for HP printers, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. The real costs are all below the surface. And this is, this is similar to other things. It's not just print. So we're going to talk about print um, and just give you a little bit of an approach there. Uh, but understand that the presentation doesn't have to be about print. It could be about anything else. Uh, IT departments, 15% of IT budgets are dealing with printing. And 20 to 23% of uh, the calls to help desks are all revolving around printers. That's a very big expense. So you heard some of the trends uh, from my colleagues. I'm going to just go through them real quick. Scanning is really, really big. When I started in this industry, 
when copiers weren't even networked, um, they called them copiers. Then all of a sudden they started printing and, and then IT departments started referring to them as printers. Guess what they're calling them now? That's right, they're calling them scanners. And what's most interesting, uh, from my point of view, because I'm a service provider, um, the amount of copies that are being made are less and less every single year. What's driving the volume is all print. However, the um, feeders are getting tremendous amount of service, and that's because of scanning. So the manufacturers are all basically dealing with that issue. Let me go back. I inadvertently hit a button. So another one is um, this huge growth in mobility. Uh, Scott touched upon that as well. I mean, people are walking around with laptops and iPads and, uh, you know, widgets and, and wadgets. And, uh, and the, the, the thing that's beautiful about this is that the, uh, the advent of the cloud is really enabling a lot of very powerful applications mobily. So when we're talking to clients, we're very interested in interoperability and a holistic view of a technology approach inside an enterprise. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at print, uh, screens, I mean, it makes no difference what you're doing. Everyone is talking about mobility and security is always a big issue uh, when it comes to that as well. The cloud is huge. Uh, the cloud is bringing just tremendous application capability and hopefully in better security than we can have on our own. And then you've got this idea of digital signage. So whether you're dealing with this uh, or if we have an interactive board or if I have a, a, uh, a network of screens that I'm pushing uh, information to, um, or if I'm using uh, the mobile device to communicate to you uh, inside my, my enterprise, that is a very, very uh, big trend, and it's actually been an explosive uh, growth area for us. So the idea is you must have a strategy, and that's really the focus of, of my short presentation is here. You, you must have a strategy. You can't just go out and buy another printer. You can't just go out and buy another projector. You know, you need to look at this and have a strategy. So let's talk about that for a second. So there are really three legs to, uh, to a strategy. You've got your in infrastructure, you've got workflows, and then you've got the support associated with whatever it is we're talking about. So a couple of things about infrastructure. You, you heard a, a little bit about it already. You know, you've got all the things, all of those things, uh, you know, servers, uh, all, all of the endpoints on your network. You've got all of the, everything that you're dealing with from uh, the physical world, uh, that's your infrastructure. Uh, workflows are what gets me excited. So I'm, I, I always get excited, not about selling you a new copier. I get excited about end-to-end -end solutions that actually make your people more productive or give you the ability to get your... Uh, accounts payable more productive and get paid faster, uh, you know, pay your invoices faster, whatever it is. I mean, the idea is to, to make you do better, and, and workflow is, is where that comes from. And then you've got, you know, the support. So if, if you don't keep the wheels on the bus, it um, doesn't matter how much you invest in this, it's, it's going to be a waste of money. So the idea is you've got to have support, you've got to have adaptability, um, you've you got to have people that are going to provide training. Um, you got to make sure that whatever solution you put in place is going to actually be used so you can get a return on investment from it. So let's take it all. You know, you take these three things, you pull them together. Uh, now you have a strategy. Or always want their staff to be more productive. You've got business continuation planning, disaster recovery, and then, of course, there's the almighty green initiative. Still haven't figured that one out yet. It's uh, a lot of taglines and a lot of marketing. But we are doing some recycling and, uh, you know, that we, we have to look at that as well because it is important. We do care about the earth. So, so the bottom line is, on, from a financial standpoint, I'm going to look at print now and just give you a little bit of an idea of what you're looking at here. So upper left-hand corner, those are your copiers. Upper right-hand corner, those are your printers. Take a look at those two columns. They look pretty similar to me. Now, what's interesting is when we come into most of our clients for the first time, look at the lower left-hand corner, You've got multiple vendors dealing with either of these things, even though, to me, it's exactly the same thing. When someone in an enterprise hits print, what do they care where it's coming out of? Um, it's still print, right? When you go over to scan something, whether it's a desktop scanner on an accounts payable clerk's desk or a monster production scanner, you're still doing what? You're taking paper and entering it into a system. It's still scanning. So this is one of the reasons why, why people don't know how much they're spending. You've got, you've got one person in the enterprise that's buying copiers and they're paying a lease and the service, it's usually all bundled in and they got a pretty good handle on what the hard costs are. 
But then you got people in, in departments individually buying printers. You got a million people ordering toner. There's toners, you know, everywhere. Um, IT is going crazy trying to figure it out. And, and you really don't know which cost is. So the idea is that, you know, this is one of those things where um, you got to start looking at it a little differently and not just do it the way we've always done it if you want to really save money and impact such the situation. So this is what it looks like when you streamline it a little bit better. So remember, you're paying about 3% of your annual revenue uh, for this. Um, what you might not also know is roughly 25% of everything that employees print gets thrown into the garbage. That's a, that's a pretty big number. Uh, keeping a printer plugged in costs about 10 bucks a month just for electricity. So when we go into a big organization that has 500 printers, they want to get rid of some of them because some of them aren't doing that much work. So when you come to security now, um, let's talk about the print environment there. So um, if 25% of what's being printed is getting thrown in the garbage, let's talk about a real world scenario. So my colleague, Mike over there, that's, that's who your contact is at LDI. So Mike, Mike wants to print a uh, presentation that he's going to be bringing over to Michael Clay uh, to try to sell him something. He's, he's running late because um, everybody is multitasking uh, and you know, we're always running to a deadline. So he hits print. He, he, he runs out to the copier to pick up his presentation to bring to Michael. But what he didn't know was two minutes before he hit print, I hit print and I'm printing a master report that I'm bringing into the boardroom uh, to talk about the last quarter um, in great detail. He knows this report is a disaster. So what does he do? Anybody? What's he going to do? Exactly. He goes back to his desk, he hits print, sends it to another device, picks up his PowerPoint, runs out, meets with Michael. Now what happens when my job finishes printing? Exactly. His job comes out, and then what happens to it? Well, it doesn't get thrown away yet. Usually it moves over, right? Somebody moves it over, and it sits there for a little while. Then it moves into the blue basket, and then eventually, hopefully, it's, it's being recycled. So that's, that's that piece that's wasted. Um, in a lot of cases, we print something, we don't like it, we print it again. Um, so we're not soft proofing on the screen when we might be able to save that first print. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff uh, wrapped around that. But let's talk about the security impl implications of that. So if, if I print something and it's sitting there, and now someone else comes and picks up their job and gets the last page of my job with their job, and there just happened to be a social security number on there or a benefit statement um, talking about you know, some uh, doctor's visit or there's, you know, there's some massive uh, project that's being worked on that could be uh, you know, at risk because we don't want anybody to know what's happening yet, that is really where the security comes in. So, Thinking about not letting that happen anymore is, is a very big part of this conversation. Hard disk security. So now it's time to refresh the copier fleet. The copiers roll out. What happens to all the data that's sitting on those hard drives? What happens if somebody gets those hard drives and prints all the data or, or just takes it and downloads it to a computer? You know, these are things that have to be considered. A lot of people don't think about that. I think about it every time a copier comes out of one of my client's offices. The thing is that these are all the types of things wrapped around security that are involved in just print. Start talking about the cop, the, uh, the uh, computers and the servers. You know, it's, it's a very similar conversation there. Uh, security breaches. To this day, 25% of security breaches are still paper-based. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm walking out of the enterprise with a bundle of paper under my arm. I might be walking over to a scanner and scanning that outside of my organization. Uh, you know, uh, client lists, proprietary uh, information about technology, uh, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. A big portion of it is hard drive based, thumb drives, computers that are misplaced, stolen, or whatever, but still 25% is paper based. It's mind blowing. So, so now let's talk about regulations for a second. So the compliance piece, you know, you've got, if you're involved in securities, you have FINRA regulations. If you're a corporation, you've got Sarbanes-Oxley and reporting issues. You have HIPAA, um, you know, breathing down your neck anytime you're dealing with private healthcare information. So in a print environment, you want to make sure that none of this stuff is available to anybody that it shouldn't be available to. In a scan environment, you want to make sure that you are controlling what is scanning. So. Uh, just a little tidbit, the key to compliance is not something you could go and buy. I can't go and buy a box of compliance. 
compliance is, is enabled through process. And process today is enabled through technology. So we could talk about that um, on the panel level. And then there's the process improvement. I left this slide pretty blank um, because any process can be improved. Um, improved by being more secure, being faster, being easier, um, you know, uh, easier, easier to collaborate, um, easier to um, evaluate and measure. I mean, there's a, there's a million things we could talk about. I could spend hours just talking about process improvement. But that is really what everyone in this room is looking for, better process. And then there's the green initiative. So the one thought I want to leave you with there as it relates to print is everybody we talk to wants to cut costs, right? Well, everybody wants to run more efficiently. They want to save money. Um, how am I going to print for less money? I always say, let's not talk about printing for less money. Let's talk about printing less. I'll help you print for less money, but the real golden nugget out there is let me print less. So the idea is we bring those three pieces together. We lay it over the client's goals, and, and now you have a, a real strategy. And in this case, it would be a, a print environment, a scan environment strategy. So the question then is, how, what do I do now? All right, so now I have a strategy. How do I implement that strategy? What do I do? So a very interesting study was done. This, this slide will make your head explode. So let me explain it to you because it's, it's very hard to understand it. So the vertical axis, this, this, this here, that's the percentage of people in the survey that responded that way. The horizontal axis is how many, how, how much did they save? What percentage did they save when they refreshed their print environment? So if you see the left side, you've got from 1 to 19% savings, 20% over there, 15% of the people said they saved 20 to 24%. But the right side, we actually have up to 41% cost reduction reported. So the thing is, what is the difference? What makes the right side different from the left side? And here it is. The left side did a like for like. We've got a copier here and a printer there. I want a copier here and a printer there. The right side said, throw a hand grenade in what I have now, blow it up. Let's go with a clean sheet design. Let's start from scratch. Now the beauty of technology is it's evolving so fast, you really need to do that for a lot of things because the solution that's available to you today wasn't available to you five years ago, three years ago, the last time you went around this, this uh, project. So this is how we're going to close it now. I'm going to give you just real quick a real-life scenario from one of our, our clients, one of, one of our actual engagements. So we've got a client. This is one floor. This is one floor of multiple floors. Um, they basically were spending almost 10 grand a month. Uh, to keep their print environment going. That was uh, basically five Rico copiers and 62 Hewlett Packard printers. The thing that was fascinating to me, three to one ratio of employee to print device. That's very, very big. And they had 22 different devices, so that means 22 different types of toner that had to be ordered on a regular basis, 22 different types of drivers that IT had to manage just so someone can hit print and actually get a piece of paper to come out the other end. So. A little bit expensive on, on the infrastructure side. Was it a law firm? Uh, this was a law firm. We do a lot of those. <laughs> so um, so um, now let's take a look at this. So a like for like, right? So we always run that. If I just do what you have and give you the new version, I could save you 15%. That was almost $1,500 savings. You would think that they'd be happy with that. 15% reduction to have what I had yesterday, awesome, really exciting. But here's what wound up happening. We did a complete, a complete clean sheet design, and, and the, the key to making this work was software. It wasn't the copiers of the printers, it was software. So what software was able to do is provide a secure print environment here. So now I hit print, nothing comes out. I gotta go and release the job. I have to authenticate at the device. Um, I got the ability to print mobily, so now I can take my iPhone, my Android, my tablet, I could hit print and I can, just like from my computer, I could go and I can securely release the job. Very, very cool. I got one driver that IT has to manage for every device. Um, they love that. I've got phenomenal reporting and statistics so I could actually see what my end users are doing. I could see by department what's happening. So three years from now, when I have to refresh again, I actually have empirical data that I could use to make a better business decision of what I need to do uh, the next time around. 
I've got a 10 to 1 employee ratio of, of employees to devices now, so I got rid of most of them, which is really cool. I've got an MPS contract managing the actual single function HP printers, so automatic toner replenishment, I'm paying per page, I'm not dealing with it anymore, I'm worrying about delivering law and not dealing with that. Very, very cool. And then on top of that, I'm reducing my print by 20%. Now we usually see a 10 to 20% reduction in print just from doing this. In some cases, it's even more. And that's because of the secure print function. So I hit print, Mike hits print, he goes over to release his job, he sees my job is coming out. He's not gonna get it from that machine. He's gonna walk over to another machine and authenticate and then his job comes out. Very, very cool stuff. This is totally enabled by software and, and technology. So the deal is that um, you've gotta go through phases in order, in order to do this correctly. You must have uh, really, really good discovery. You have to be willing to think outside the box and not just, we did, always, always done it this way, let's just do it this way again. You have to be willing to be a little more creative and out of the box in your thinking so that you could take advantage of the technology that's out there. And then you phase it in. I mean, you could do it all at once, you could phase it in, you could do it any way you want. Uh, but the main thing is you gotta have a plan, you gotta have a strategy. So, um, I'm gonna go to the last slide just so you can get Mike's cell phone number. So if you need to talk to us, that's Mike over there, Mike Lowe. He is the guy to call. So a little tidbit about doing business with LDI and how we operate. So we deal with uh, a lot of very high-end manufacturers. Everybody wants us to sell their products. So we really go for a, a best of breed uh, type of, a, of an arrangement. So we have, we're Canon's largest independent dealer in the Northeast, for example. So if you want to work with us, if you want to work with our clients, the way we work is it's all referred lead prospecting. Some people in this room are already our clients. Some people in this room are going to become our clients. You're already engaged. Um, and that's because we do an engagement and then people talk and then we do another one and people talk and we do another one. So a big way that we work is through referrals. So if you want to do business with our clients, we want to do business with your clients. So it's a very, very much uh, a synergistic relationship. So I would recommend that you talk to Mike. Um, let's get you on the wheel. If there's any way that we can work together, uh, we totally welcome that opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Okay, we're now going to move into the technology. I'm gonna ask the panelists just to remain seated and slide the uh, appropriate microphones in front. And let's talk about, um, and starting with Carol, Carolyn. Carolyn, we talked a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the, um, you mentioned briefly about the uh, scheduling. I'd like you to go into a little bit, a greater detail about your open source and your APIs as it relates to your mobile apps uh, and also anything else that would be applicable from a technology perspective. I'd then like to have uh, Scott to follow up from First Data to kind of talk a little bit about that. I know, Mike, you just finished talking a little bit about, but you can add something. Be mindful of time frame, please, because I want to make sure we leave sufficient amount of time for the audience to be able to question um, in terms of the panelists, okay? Carolyn? So we have uh, uh, actually a whole developer community that uh, we've got a Google group. Um, if you go to the mta.info webpage, um, the instructions on how to access our data and download it uh, are available on that webpage. The data is free, um, but if you do want to use any MTA um, uh, logos or intellectual assets, you have to get that license. Um, it is possible for the MTA to actually uh, approve and support the thing that you've developed so that it's kind of MTA sponsored, um, but it doesn't have to be. You can go out and, and do the development and we not like it. <laughs> so, um, but the, the data is open source and it is schedule information that's provided. So you've got train schedule when the trains are scheduled to depart and when they're scheduled to arrive. And then you have actual real time data that we are capturing that's fed um, in, in these, uh, they're called GTFs, GTFS feeds. 
uh, so you can subscribe to those as well. Um, and there, uh, w we monitor the Google groups, we answer questions and so on. Uh, the developers reach out to, the, the developer community actually reaches out to our developers when they have issues, so um, th that's how we uh, publish the open data. Okay, Scott? Sure. <coughs> so first data, um, when you talk about payment processing, it's a tremendously complex environment. There's... Sure. Is this better? Great. Thank you for that. Um, so what we've tried to do at First Data is because innovation is important, is we've tried to create the opportunities for developers to take advantage of all that complexity, um, to generate technology and to do development that will build relationships with us. So for an example, um, we have APIs, public APIs, we have development toolkits, we have the environments where developers can, in a number of different languages, whether it's Java or Rails, Ruby on Rails, things like that, where you can develop relationships with us, develop the software. Um, we have programs in which you can install the software, so it's a credit card payment um, on processing on the machines, you can do certification with us, and then you can actually create your own businesses around that. Um, I mentioned our Clover um, solution. Clover is a point of sale. It's a fully integrated point of sale. Um, Clover itself, from a hardware perspective, has uh, wireless, uh, bigger machines for point of sale, but it also has a level of software on it that would provide um, software for any different um, functions within your business. That's an also an open API. You can develop software there you can have access to um, create, change, configure, um, you know, software. What we're trying to do is promote an open environment that really uh, pushes innovation out and creates not only opportunities for us to do business, but opportunities for developers and software innovators to um, have access to all the systems we have in the payment processing field. Okay, I think Clayton wants to uh, jump in here. For I just want to say something real quick <clears throat> for everybody here. What you're hearing, is it like that? You're going to turn me off? Really? What you're hearing, if, you, if, if any of you are in this room, if any of you are looking to build your current business or looking to start a new business, if you don't know what they mean by API, for example, sometimes what happens is when you're so close to technology, you start throwing out acronyms and you assume everybody knows what it means. The API... If you don't know what that means, it's an application programming interface. Did you guys know that? <laughs> so anyway, the point is, what that allows you to do is use their platform for your product or service. So instead of you having to build, for example, to know where all of the MTA stations are, that's already built into their platform, so you don't have to go out and find that and design that. Or in First Data's case, if you don't want, if you don't, if you've never interfaced with credit cards, you don't have to invent that process. It's already there. So let's put this in context. If you are a small business owner, if you're a business owner, if you're someone who's trying to build a business or want to create a new business, what they are saying is we are giving you everything you need to do that now. Now you need a developer to help you. That's why I'm here. But the point is, you know, if you're trying to start an Uber, you know, Uber didn't invent the mapping technology they have on that. They went and found an API. If you're trying to do financial literacy, what they're saying is there's platforms that will, MasterCard will give you their infrastructure so you can start that. So that's what this means. I just want to put it in context because some of you want to be, you know, build your business or start a new business. What the MTGA just told you is we have a whole department to help you do that, saving you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Thank you. Mike. It's a uh, very interesting topic. A, a lot of the printer manufacturers that we work with actually provide this capability. Um, all of them are a little different. Uh, they all work a little differently. Um, I could give you an example, like if you want to work with HP, you can forget it. They've, they're locked down and proprietary from one end to the next. 
Um, if you want to work with companies like Toshiba, Sharp, uh, or Samsung, um, pretty easy to do. You want to work with Canon, it's much more like working with Apple where everything is extremely vetted. So for us as integrators, when I, when I put a solution on a Canon and it's, and it's embedded, I know it works because it's, it's been so well vetted. If I'm going with a different manufacturer, I need to test it a lot before I put it out in the field because there's always a concern that it's just so wide open, you don't know if it's going to work. But if you want to develop um, things that are going to help improve workflow and or integrate a, another software solution, like if there's a scanning workflow and you've got some kind of a solution on the back end or an accounting system and you wanted to integrate it uh, with one of these devices and have a button to get into your system, that's the kind of stuff that can be enabled uh, with this type of code and, uh, and APIs. And a lot of it, I believe, is, is JavaScripting. I, I don't know if you know that. Um, but that's pretty much what most of them are using now. So it is definitely an opportunity uh, for growth um, and certainly for creativity. Did anyone, more importantly, lose glasses? <laughs> Did anyone misplace their glasses? And they see. <laughs> I don't know. But if they can't see, then they, I would raise my hand. Well, anyway. This lovely young lady behind me here has your glasses or someone you know may have lost their glasses. So let's do a little brief recap because I want to get into the Q&A. You guys have been very good. You've sat here patiently for the past hour almost. And so now I want to get into the nitty gritty. Okay, we've heard presentations from the three presenters. You've heard first data. You've heard from, um, uh, from, um, um, uh, uh, LDI, you've also heard from the MTA mm -hmm. about what the process is, what do they do, how do you do it. Remember I said when we first started this, this cruise ride, it's all about the process, no matter whether it's a construction project or professional services or technology. How do I procure, how do I enter into the game, as what Clayton just mentioned, you have access for the MTA, you have access from first data, and you also heard uh, Mike talk about access for some of the corporations that he represents, okay? So now we understand the process. The next thing is the technology. You've heard about the technology, whether it's credit cards, whether it's, you know, um, uh, helping you to be more efficient in terms of your infrastructure. And LDI went through a big conversation about the print media and how it saves you money and, and all of that, but it boils down to this, ladies and gentlemen, your infrastructure is critical as I started this conversation. If your infrastructure is not sound, if it's not tight, then you are spending money, you're adding pricing to your price that you don't need to add. So, with that being said, um, any questions? Okay, hold on please, you're gonna stand up. This young man coming up is going to give you the microphone you are, tell her who, tell you, who you are, are and what you represent. And who you, if you have a business, what services you provide. Okay, my name is uh, Colette Boston, and um, I'm an author. But there is a business that I'm getting into a nonprofit called Stepping Stones Incorporated that I'm starting from scratch. And basically, the question I wanted to ask, and it can be directed to anyone, but. Um, Many times, because I've done taxes for the last 12 years, or as a tax preparer, and one of the things I wanted to ask you was, many of the big companies purposely bought extra equipment so they could use the depreciation on that equipment to lower their bottom line and also pay less for taxes using depreciation. When you streamline that, how does that affect their bottom line and their tax, the possible tax loss? Most, most of our clients do not purchase outright. Most of our clients finance. What happens when you do a, 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 an operating lease, uh, which is what we normally do, the entire lease payment becomes tax deductible. So there is no depreciation requirement. So if I do a three-year operating lease on uh, you know a copier fleet every dollar that they spend is is deducted as an operating expense 
Now, I'm not giving anybody tax. This is my disclaimer. I'm not an, I, I am not an accountant, and I am not providing tax uh, advice to anyone in this room. This is not okay? H&R Block. <laughs> if this is the way the questions are going to go, I'm out of here, man. This is, that was a good question, though. Very insightful. If you need your taxes done, you know who to go to now. You need to go to. Next question. Gentleman right here. Hi, my name is Clarence Williams. Uh, I am an entrepreneur. My company was Easy Way Ordering. We did online ordering platform for restaurants. Uh, it was acquired in 2015 by First Data, and that's why I work with these gentlemen now. Um, my question was for you with the MTA. Uh, I noticed, I think your number two bullet point was around the, uh, the experience where customers can purchase tickets, fares, et cetera. Um, you may have heard we know a couple things about that. Okay. Uh, I was wondering how First Data could get involved or, or pitch the MTA or, or help collaborate on developing a solution that would be more efficient for your customers. Okay. Well, wow. I wouldn't be an entrepreneur if I didn't try, no, right? Listen, listen. I hear you, I hear you, brother, I hear you. Well, well one, we, you certainly could give me your card. Um, in information technology, we're always looking for new ways to, to solve problems and for innovation. That's one. The other is there are RFPs that come out uh, for new technologies, and, and you, can, you can go in and bid on some of these. Um, if you are an MWBE or a disadvantaged uh, business uh, entrepreneur, you can also um, uh, work with people who have already uh, been awarded the bid because they usually have some percentage of, of the contract award for uh, small businesses. So um, there, there's a couple ways. The, the other way is um, we're always looking uh, to do staff augmentation and to just work directly with, with small businesses, but we still have to go through a whole procurement process to do that. So, uh, you know, one, being in touch with us and understanding what our projects are and working with us, that will, will help. Also keep in mind, and this gentleman first behind you, then this gentleman in front of him, keep in mind that if it's a public agency and MTA and DASNY are in that boat, Everything is on their website, and I would assume that with yeah. LDI and also with uh, Scott's firm, First Data, same thing. Everything is all on the website, so that's what you should familiarize yourself with. If it is a public entity, either the state of New York, the New York State contract reporter is the procurement arm for the state of New York. Any purchase $5,000 or more must be advertised and the New York State contract reporter. If you're dealing with a New York City mayoral agency here in the five boroughs, it is the city record. So those would be the two procurement arms to find out about any kind of technology or any kind of procurement that any public entity is doing. Sir. Hi, my name is Andrew Clark, and I'm a UX designer. Um, in my previous life as a network administrator, close to 15 years ago, I was charged with locating businesses that had um, paperless environments. So I'm wondering how close are we to achieving that goal? <laughs> Not close enough, I can tell you that one right now. Uh, Everybody's looking at me, yeah. I don't know why. Um, well, your, your bathroom is gonna be paperless before your office is, I can tell you that. <laughs> oh boy, whoa, 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 oh, nice standard, whoa. Standard line there. So uh, the, tru the truth is, the, tr the truth is that it pa paper is becoming less. Um, everybody that we do business with, it's it's less. Uh, it's always less. Um, we don't think it's going to go away for a long time, but it is less. And what's making it less is the technology. So where you, you know, you might have a physical validation now for a purchase, right? So someone someone makes a purchase. Um, I've got to have it validated. It's validated on paper. Once you move to an automated system, the validation becomes a click of a mouse, a, a, a digital signature, things like that. So now that paper doesn't uh, need to be created anymore. So those are the types of things that are, are eliminating paper. We're not really receiving faxes anymore. We're getting an email now. You know, so um, a lot of that paper is going away. But I'll tell you, like in my world, I try to be paperless. I have very, very few files. But if you come into my office, I always have stacks, of, ask Michael, I have stacks of paper on my desk at all times. Um, and I just can't seem to get away from it. 
I can't, I can't proofread something on the screen. I see, I see, I see what's not there. It's like it, it's, it's. I, I don't know what my brain does, but it corrects it by itself, when, and I don't see the mistakes. But when it's on paper, I can see the mistakes, and I have a feeling that that's generational. So when the millennial, when the millennials <laughs> take over, I have a feeling that there's going to be a much less paper, because they're much more, um, you know, into this than they are into uh, actual paper. But it's going to be a while. Okay. All right, sir. And then the young lady next. Uh, Jamal Thomas, to uh, Arise Technology. I uh, do technology consulting to help companies uh, save money on their telecommunications and cloud services. Um, this question is for Scott. I've been following blockchain with uh, my friends uh, a lot lately, and uh, as a financial company, curious to find out what the what the applications where the where the rubber is really hitting the road. Like whose calls are you actually picking up related to blockchain, and what are some of the use cases uh, that that uh, are, are currently going on? Sure, great question. Um, you know, in the technology world, when you hear blockchain, you think Bitcoin. Um, blockchain itself um, is, it's a little closer to, away from bleeding edge than it is leading edge. So from a, a first data perspective, it's, it's an area that we're looking at a lot. Um, when you talk about from the cost perspective of data um, and the integrity of data, it's definitely something that we're investing in. Um, how that bleeds into our relationships with merchants and vendors, it's kind of a back office thing that's something that, uh, you know, almost like the black box where you really don't have to care how the data is stored. But we're seeing a lot of value in that and some of the other bleeding edge technologies on the ways we can uh, promote our relationships with our third parties and with our, our other partners. Um, I think when you talk about Bitcoin, um, because that's really pushing in the financial industry a lot of people to take a look at it. Um, it's pulling a long blockchain with it. So we're seeing that it's definitely now a viable solution for, for just regular database storage, um, but also the, the interaction of um, the application layers for making, accessing data, storing data, making decisions on data, analyzing data. I think we're gonna see industry-wide, that blockchain is something that is, um, in just a couple of years, will be almost a standard. Clay? Okay. Thanks. Everybody understood just what happened? No. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to say very quickly. One, you heard one gentleman stand up and say he was a UX designer. Everybody understand what that means? User experience designer. Second, this question about the blockchain coming from Mr. Thomas, who's a friend of mine. Um, you're hearing that word as a buzzword quite a bit right now, blockchain, blockchain, blockchain. As I said earlier, bone up on artificial intelligence. You also want to get very studious around blockchain. We are going to have a whole discussion about that at the Silicon Harlem conference, bringing in the top people around this. Blockchain could be used for many things. Social good, real estate, networking. It has a lot of impact. I'm sorry? Document storage. Document storage. My word for 2018 is democratization, and blockchain has a lot to do with that. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Um, hi. My name is Sandra Clark, and we're not related, or maybe we are. Let's find out with our next family reunion. Um, I'm a secondary teacher, high school. A lot of us teachers are finding ourselves sort of pushed out of the, um, you know, the brick and mortar buildings. I want to know what we can do is, I'm, I'm the point person because I love Harlem and I love to travel. They said, you go up there and you find out and come back and tell us. We're not affiliated with 65 Court Street, with, which is the Department of Education. We kind of want to branch out on our own so that we have more control about you know, how we teach and what works with us or for us. Mm -hmm. And my, my question is, I'm from Brooklyn. I had a very good commute, thank you. And um, I, I do, I love the trains. I, I, even if I'm delayed, I like them. I don't know what it is, I love them. And Record that lady for a No, I, do. <laughs> I really love them. That's, I, no, I love, no, it's okay. I always com converse with people. It's not a problem, I'm a teacher. But my question is, how do I upgrade myself? I'm a liberal arts major. I, I love business, I love the acronyms, I love learning, but like, what do I do? Do I have to go back to school again? Clayton, why don't you take a shot at that yeah. and start? Thank you for the question. We're all upgrading ourselves as we go along. I would imagine you have a smartphone. That's, that's, that's a great tool right in your pocket. Mapping, 
educational courses, all types of things can be done with your smartphone already. You have to take advantage of it. You know, there's all of you. Do you realize there's a minimum six radios in your cell phone? Six different radios in your cell phone. If you took it apart, you could figure this out. So six different radios in your cell phone. So there's a lot of capability within a smartphone. I would start there just to, because I know you probably carry it almost everywhere you go. But in terms of just educating yourself about technology, no, you don't have to go back to school necessarily, but you have to stay up on what's happening. And not every single piece of new information you're going to have to always get involved in. But get involved in those things that you have most interest in and where you are proficient, right? So what we miss in technology is people with experience and know the topic. We just know how to put the tools on top of it. So I don't know, I mean, there's a lot of developers that I know that are excellent, but have no idea about what a teacher has gone through or what a teacher may have to do. So we have to do what we call marry art and tech, marry education and tech, marry every discipline with tech because tech can enhance that experience. So it's not about your deficiency, it's about your collaboration to make things move forward. You had, and then Mike. So what we're next. what we're seeing in the classroom now, um, the technology is not changing the lesson plan, but it's changing the way the lesson plan is being delivered. So, where ten years ago you would go to a copier and uh, and print out the workbooks and then hand them out to the class and then stand in front of the class with a chalkboard, which then became a smart board and deliver your lesson. Now what's happening is the we're starting to get visual display technology in the classroom where you've got this in interoperability where you know the kids might have tablets and the teacher is standing in front of the room with a tablet and the lesson is behind her on the, on the smart board and she's controlling the classroom. So let's say you're doing a math problem and you see that this guy over here is, is solving the problem in a very creative way that's different from everyone else. You might say, hey, I'm going to put yours up so we can see what you're doing. You hit a button, and now all of a sudden, his tablet's on the front of the room, and you're talking about what he's doing. You know, it, and, and teachers are starting to utilize this technology to pull the shy kid out and you know, try to get them to be you know, more, more in the front. And, and uh, we're seeing Google playing a, a huge role here. So a lot of the lesson plans are coming down from the cloud, right, from, from Google. You have... Uh, you have um, testing being done digitally and then you're graphing the responses i mean it's that's what's changing it's and, and for you to learn this new technology is not a, is not going to be a big deal do not be afraid of that your integrator is going to have to provide the training and make it work you, you would take to it like a fish to water okay you're still right. delivering a lesson plan uh you know just listening to uh what's going so on here from, yeah oh where Come i'm from infomercial oh. infomercial <laughs> infomercial <laughs> Uh, my name is Michael Sutton. Uh, I am the president of Infrastructure Engineering. We started off with two people. Today we're approximately 90 people with multiple offices. And so, you know, I'm listening to the people here, especially the beginning entrepreneurs and maybe some of the advanced people. When we started off as two people, I'm an engineer. And at that time, when I started off, uh, 20 years ago, um, we, uh, other firms were, uh, especially our big partners, the big companies had uh, integrated IT with servers and all that type of stuff. So when I started off in business with two people, <clears throat> we had to invest in a integrated IT, even though we only had three computers uh, and one server. And, and, and so we had to invest. So my advice to people in the room is, is that uh, even in my home, we have multiple devices and, and, and all that type of stuff. I don't know this stuff. And so from day one, when I went into business, I had a part-time IT person that helped us on a daily basis to make sure that our systems and stuff were operating, was connected properly, and all that type of stuff. And even in my home, I have to do the same thing because you know, the kids, the, the wife, they, you know, things are not working, so I gotta call somebody up. So, so, so what I advise to entrepreneurs and, and even individuals is that this is not your expertise. Get yourself some help. Make sure you invest in IT and keep your system operating. I cannot afford to have my system down one day. 
that would cost me thousands and thousands of dollars. One of the challenges that we have in our, our business with the multiple offices is the internet service providers are not universal. And so it's really cool when you got Comcast in Chicago and you got Comcast in Indianapolis and you got Comcast in LA and in New York because all you, everything is IT now. Your telephones, your computers, your everything works properly. And so, but in offices where we don't have a common IT provider, we run into difficulties. And I'm like, I'm even talking to my IT guy, well, there's nothing we really can do to integrate a Comcast with a uh, whatever. With, Time uh, Warner. <laughs> yeah, Time Warner. And so, so that makes it really difficult. So how can we integrate, we talk about integration, how can we integrate our offices where we can use the technology to connect them? And where when I hit a telephone number, uh, you know, the four digit telephone number where our offices are connected, I get my person. But when our office is not connected, I have to dial the, the 10 digits or whatever. Yeah, it's, it's 10 digits, right? <clears throat> so how do we do that? So, you know, what I kind of figure out what you're talking about is where's the accountability lie, right? And, and then it's better. If, you know, I didn't understand what the cloud was. You know, I'm not, I'm not the brightest IT person. You talk about cloud. I was like, what the hell is a cloud? And then talk about remote server. You know, so, yeah, so, you know, the language that, you know, you guys do, it, it'd be nice if you guys would explain it a little bit. Yeah, but then we, then we wouldn't have jobs, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and listen, you can get definitions, different definitions of cloud from everybody. Um, just to your point, though, about where's the accountability lie, and you're running your business on that network. Um, going back to what I mentioned when I was standing up there, this is why it's so important to develop really strong relationships and find organizations that will accept the accountability. Um, and you can find them out there. I know at First Data, when we're talking with merchants and we're talking with small business, we don't want to just sell them a piece of software and walk away. Um, surprisingly, there's a lot of companies out there that will still do that. Um, I don't know how they compete because it's, it's not just a solution to run your inventory or in your case maybe to do monitoring on your network and think, it's how do I get support? You know, how do I define support and what are my service level agreements so that when there is a problem, how can I go about handling that? That's why you need a partner that will address all that. And that's why I say that relationship is so important. It's, it should go beyond the piece of software you buy. It should go about how do I run my business and what are the expectations when things happen. So it's, it's you know, mind-boggling to me sometimes when businesses are putting all of that effort into it um, that you still find companies out there that really aren't being accountable to provide you that service. And that's why you really need to, to demand that, that. And that's why it's, um, you know, to take advantage of the technology, they need to know what your business is. We're down to two more questions, so this gentleman, this gentleman, and here, and then we're going to have to close. <coughs> yeah. My name is Aaron Shaw. I'm a recent graduate from Morrow College. I graduated my business, and minors is information technology. I have a question for Silicon Harlem and First Data. My question is, what area of technology does Silicon Harlem focus on even when working with software? What can Silicon Harlem do when competing with different countries to improve their technology? And First Data? How much code is required to maintain the system, and how often do you update the application when you're working on it? And also, what makes you different from other companies that compete with you, such as Apple? Okay. So from a first data standpoint, let me just make sure I understand what you're asking. If you're going to be become partners with us, how often do we update, upgrade, and how... Um, you know, what's the expectation you can have for us to provide you the best service and the most up-to-date service? So from that alone, um, you know, when we're, um, you know, f for us, the APIs, we, the application program interfaces and those technologies we're generating to allow you to do business with us, that for us is basically a line of business. So we have a whole group that is just focused on that. 
So, you know, when we provide an API, the API itself may not change, but the programming that goes on behind it does. So, you know, when you say, you know, I want to use First Data, why? Because they have all the complexity and they can deal with all the different payment processing, which there's so many different ways to do payment processing. You know, they're going to take care of that for me. Um, what you're doing is you're creating a relationship with us, so we're exposing all of that to you. So you have all of that information. Um, one, we want to make sure your business is running. Two, we want to make sure that you know what we're doing behind the scenes. Um, that information is publicly available. Um, we have groups where you can become partners with those groups. Um, there's so much value. We kind of started originally talking about it's people. It really is people. We're trying to empower people. So that to us is almost like um, it, it's the technology, but it's the group of people that are using the technology that we're treating. So we don't want to talk technology at that level. We want to make sure that you have what you have. You have access to the right people to ask questions. When we're doing major things, you'll know about it. You'll be able to sustain your business. So like I said, we have a whole group of people that are working just on that, and we're interacting with people like you if you're, you're partnering with us, that there's total transparency, and that's how something like that works. Um, so your other question was about competition. Um, sure. Yep. So first data, um, it, it's an interesting relationship. We may compete in those areas, but we really partner with those groups. So when Apple came, Apple Pay came out, we were very quick to market on accepting Apple Pay through our first data um, systems. Um, basically what, you know, to, to give a picture, when you do payment processing, there's a lot of things that have to happen no matter how you're paying. Right? There's authorization, there's settlement, people want to get their money, and the transactions have to go to the right endpoints. How you pay um, causes some challenges for us. Um, we have many more than one group who are just looking at that. So Apple Pay is a good example, Android Pay. Um, all the innovation that's happening in the payment industry right now, we have groups of people who are looking just at that. And we're partnering with a company like an Apple, saying we're going to do Apple Pay, and it's going to be just sitting at the front of our systems, but it's using all of our back-end systems. So I wouldn't say so much that we're competing. We're actually partnering with all of them. Um, when new things come along, we're trying to be innovative. We're trying to be ahead of that. Um, and for the partners that are using our systems, once again, the transparency is there. They know what we're working on. Um, we listen to them so that we're investing a lot of effort into making sure that those technologies are available to somebody like you. Does that address your question? Okay. Yeah. Clayton, you want to? Thank you. I'll try to be brief. <laughs> Tell me your name again, Sean? Aaron Shaw. Aaron Shaw. First of all, Jeffrey would agree with me. That's how you ask a question. You write it down and you just ask a question. So thank you for doing that. Give this young man a nice hand. He's a good young man. Plus, you asked me a question, so I'm super happy. Um, the Silicon Harlem has two critical areas that we like to focus on when it comes to technology and what we're rolling out. Uh, one of them is your standard connectivity issues. In upper Manhattan, almost 40% do not have broadband. Hear me? Good. 40% do not have broadband. It's not an issue of access. It's an issue of affordability. So we believe that that's an issue we have to address and a gap we have to close. So we're doing it in a bunch of different ways and I'm not gonna get too particularly into right now, but I will tell you that that is a mission that we are very focused on. The second one is we've heard this term digital divide. Digital divide. Well, the fact of the matter is digital divides have existed for a long time. They come and they come and they come and they come. There was a digital divide when we rolled out cable. Went to, exp went to affluent neighborhoods first and it rolled down to low income later. We had digital divide when we rolled out the internet. Went to affluent homes, rolled down to low income later. The current one is broadband where we went to the affluent homes and now we've priced it to where the affluent homes can afford it and low income can. That's become less of a inner city issue and more of an economic issue, right? That's where the Trump thing comes from, where people thought they were always gonna be on the other side of that line. <laughs> they down here with the rest of us. Yeah, right? So what I'm saying to you is, Silicon Harlem is focused on, if we, if myself, who's been in the business for some time and have seen these, I've lived through these divides. In fact, I know Larry Irving, who literally came up with that phrase, digital divide, when he was working in the President Clinton's administration. 
If I know this information, if I've been exposed, if I've had access, I have to, I should be in a position to do something about it. So I'm thinking, what's the next digital divide? I'm thinking, what's next? And for me, because the obvious astute question would be, well, Clayton, what the heck is the next digital divide? In my opinion, it's smart technology. So we're hearing a lot about smart technology, and that's a good thing. But are we really educating ourselves around it? Are we on the side of it as producers and makers? Are we working with the manufacturers to make sure that it's accessible? Are we working to make sure that it's affordable? Because if I'm someone who's developing and spending my money and my treasure and my intelligence on building something for a smart city or a smart community, I'm trying to make my money back as quickly as possible. And the theory has been to go to those affluent people who, one, have access to the knowledge and two, can afford it, and therefore get ahead in that particular technology. It seems to me, as the manufacturers have found out, in almost every industry that once you get to the masses, it's actually a good thing. They always think, oh, we should have done that in the first place. Well, yeah, that's right. The problem is you have business pressures to force you to go to affluent neighborhoods first. And if your population doesn't educate itself, it will come trailing. So Silicon Harlem is focused on to ensure that inner cities and urban markets are leading technology and in fact, in some ways, leapfrogging technology so we can lead. Everyone knows urban markets is where everyone's trying to live now. So we have to now build that infrastructure to support that. So Silicon Harlem right now is working on a corridor uh, that's going to be a smart corridor in upper Manhattan that we hope we can replicate around the world. Around the world. Because this is not a New York thing. This is a worldwide thing where we can collect better data, provide low cost high-speed broadband connectivity rather than the slow-speed, high-cost that we tend to have today. We need more competition in that space, right? So when people talk about a provider and the reason why we have poor service is because sometimes it's the only one in the, in the market. So what do they have to call you back for? You know, so we are, Silicon Harlem is dead focused on the infrastructure of any community and the smart technology and any other divide that we can predict may be coming and trying to preempt it. That's what we're trying to do. Thank you. For the last two questions, we'll just take one response. For the last two questions. Good afternoon. My name is Jamil DeBay, and I'm the president of DeBay Communications, which is a marketing technology company. I'm an engineer by trade and a National Society of Black Engineer alumni, one of the founders of the Alumni Association here in the city. Uh, my question uh, for any of the panelists is how do we, okay, one of the panelists, I will pick Clayton since you break it down so well. How do you protect individuals' information? Because when I used to work at Verizon, I was uh, privy to the uh, rooms that they were data mining the information that came through all of the lines. And now that you hear every day that uh, companies, big companies that have millions of subscribers like Yahoo, they're getting compromised and all our information is out there. Matter of fact, your information gets sold back to you and you don't even own your own personal information. How do you protect, like when I work with the uh, seniors, they are so, uh, they are so affected by technology, they don't even want to get part of it because they don't want to get ripped off. So how do we protect our personal data? Great question. We all have that question. The, the, the challenge is, is how much do you give people? We certainly, yeah, on Facebook, for example, when they first came out, um, you know, most of us were like 100 years old when you signed up for Facebook. Facebook deaded all that because they wanted to know your exact age. Why is that? Because they were building an algorithm that would follow you the rest of your life. So they knew that when you graduated high school, there were certain types of material and information that you might want to know. They knew when you were probably in your college years, and they do know. They know when you might be first getting married. They may know when you are going to have a baby. They certainly know uh, when you're going to work because we tell them. So when you, when you share your information like that, you become the product. 
right? So when you're the product, they can now sell you. So it, it, that's where it starts, to your question of how do we capture some of that back. What we're trying to push on an industry level, on an enterprise level, uh, for example, video analytics. Many cities want to put up more cameras than less and be able to film everything. So we're trying to push to say, listen, you can do video analytics, but you don't need to do, do it by a person's recognition. You can do it by a person's movement, for example. There's ways to strip out the actual personal identity of people. Companies, the private sector particularly, has to be committed to that. And the public has to support that and put policies and laws in place to protect us. It's a big issue that you're asking about, Jalil. Uh, Jamil, it's a big, big issue. But the trend has been, at least with um, those who are growing up with social media, has been that there's, there seem, that they, t they think that they're protected when they're not. And they're given this information and that's making these companies stronger. When Facebook has over a billion people on their platform, they cannot go away. A billion plus people, two billion people on their platform, there's nothing that we can do to stop them in a lot of ways. So, so we have to work on an enterprise level to get people to start looking at this from a trends perspective rather than a, uh, an identity perspective. And MTA, did you want to, Carolyn, did you want to say anything? Because you guys are working on some of that. Oh, I'm sorry, just one person. Okay, we got to go. Okay, yeah, my name is Keith Williams. Um, I'm now a practicing entrepreneur. I realize I've always been an entrepreneur since I painted spinning tops at, when I was eight years old. You know, on 29th Street, I painted spinning tops. Yeah, they bought it, they bought it. Um, now, as far as technology, um, I followed up with what you said is a good way to answer question. But see, I had to go the primitive way, <laughs> you know, because I'm still there. Um, I'm, blessed, I'm blessed to have encountered um, some multiple businesses, and I can't stay away from a good opportunity, and they all center mostly around health and wellness. Matter of fact, I want to start a company called Health is True Wellness. I haven't done it yet. Um, one is a very superior, powerful ginseng. The other one's a homeopathic topical pain relief. The other one involves women, and it's a very personal issue, but it's an awareness campaign. Each have their own website. That cost me money. I'm on a shoestring budget. I'm hearing people say that you can um, create a domain, GoDaddy, so to speak. And, and, and I'm giving up different business cards, trying to have different sites. Is there a way that I can have one umbrella site? And then as I'm engaging people on relationships, that I can find out what their needs are and steer them to one particular landing page. I can't help but ask this question. I feel like I'm over the head, over my head with this technology talk, but um, that's what I want to do. I want to have an umbrella group. I want to direct to Mr. Banks. Thank you. Here's what I would suggest sure. as a beginning, as a um, first step for you. How, how aggressive are you on Facebook? Uh, have you set up your... Are you, do, you, do you have a business page? That's where I would start because the people who are interested in what you're doing and those who are interested in that space will form a community around what you're doing. So now you can communicate to that, communicate, um, to that community on a regular basis. So I recommend that for anyone. If you don't have the budget, you don't have the time, you don't have the skill set necessarily or the resources to build out a platform, a tech platform where you know, you're actually out there on the World Wide Web by yourself, I would recommend that you start in a, in a space like uh, Facebook where people are literally coming into your space because they're interested or they have some sort of, of uh, affiliation with what you're doing. We just started one, uh, or I personally started one on blockchain. So I've got hundreds of people that already automatically were just like, yes, I'm into that. And so we can now work together and then you start to monetize that. So the, I would recommend that as, as a way to get into it and, then, and that's easy something that you can do. It's not you, like you have to hire Hans over here you know, who's 20 something years old. He can do it for you, but he'll charge you. <laughs> so you wanna get out there and do that. I wanna keep that short, but talk to me afterwards, Keith, because I didn't know you had that issue. So let's, let's talk about, more about that.
Um, we're going to have to end and wrap up. Um, we're going to have Clayton kind of wrap it up um, in the next 30, 60 seconds to get this done. Number one, can we give a hand to our panelists? Okay. I'm not saying that you can't have a question. It's just that we can't do it publicly. I know this young lady had her hand up. This gentleman had his hand up to speak, and there may be others. You can engage the panelists or myself one-on-one uh, -on -one afterwards, so please don't be put off the fact that you can't ask your question. Um, number one, I just want to thank the chamber, Lloyd, and also I want to thank you all for taking your time because your time is valuable. You don't get this back. So thank you very much for spending it with us. Okay, I am going to take those 60 seconds, but I'm going to start with how about Michael Clay? He really put it in, right? I was sitting right next to him half time, and I was watching him pull the hook on these guys. Come on, get off this thing. So I uh, wanted to thank him for spending the time and, and working with all of us to, to make this panel. A, yeah, Keith, you're right. It's one of the greatest panels we've seen today on technology. Thank you very much. Um, I also wanted to thank all of you for coming out. Uh, I think Bruce, is Alfonso still in the room? Okay, well, our Deputy Commissioner of Do It is here. Uh, so if you get a chance to meet Alfonso Jenkins, he also lives in Harlem, which is phenomenal. Uh, he's one of the people that's heading up uh, what's happening with the infrastructure of New York City. So he's great. Uh, my volunteers that are now giving me this kind of signal, like, come on, Clayton, get it all over with. Uh, but good friends are here, old friends are here, new friends are here. I see our startup community is in here, knocking it out at the park. Um, Kay Shaw, if you guys don't know about uh, black public media, that is the expert in New York City right there. Kay Shaw, wave your hand, please, Kay Shaw, so people know who you are. And has adapted technology for what she's doing. She has her own hackathon. Um, her, her companies are presenting their films and doing a great job. So if you have a film or you want to talk to somebody who's in art, that is the lady, also a Harlemite. Again, thanks Jolie. Jolie is the guy in the back who does this for us. Silicon Harlem streams our events, as well as um, the Columbia University AV. Uh, Ramon, is it? Oh, Lee, okay, well anyway, we want to thank all of them. Anyway, all of you, thank you so much. Hang out for a little bit. They're wrapping it up, and I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions. And on behalf of the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce and Harlem Week 2017 Incorporated, we want to thank you for joining us for this important conversation on tech and how to improve your businesses. Some of our panelists are still here. If you have any additional questions, thank you all for coming. <laughs>